Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Valmont Community Presbyterian Church on this beautiful day. Yes or no? You can hear me? Yes. Very good. Do we have any announcements? Kathy. Okay, this is the count as of yesterday, but more food was brought in this morning, so I'm sure we're good. Um, for April, as of yesterday, um, we have 126.31 pounds. I'm doing, I'm doing ounces and everything. Um, so just keep that in mind, and I'll give you an update next week. Thanks. We need to maybe double up a little bit in May, huh? Yes. Okay. Stella. I have two quick announcements. Um, there will be a musical offering this morning. And it will be the choir, and we're featuring uh, Stephen and Dottie Ann's daughter, Sally. Sally Bird is our soloist, and uh, it's great to have her. Really thankful that she could do that. And the second announcement is that my choral group, our end of the season, is coming up next weekend. And it's a concert uh, that's centered around Native American poetry and tradition, and it culminates in a huge work with orchestra that's pretty unique. So if you're free Friday evening or Sunday afternoon, that would be in Boulder at First Congregational Church. Cantabile is our name, and I have a few cards on the piano if you want to grab one. Thank you. Anne? Uh, just so everybody knows, we've been having a little trouble with um, some of the mics and Zoom, but um, we think we've got it fixed. So people on Zoom, we've done what we could. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> And Jan, this is for you. Um, there are people on Zoom, just to remind you, if no one's told you during prayers and joys that we'll ask for them. So. And also things will be up there. Marilyn. I have, I have the um, silent auction sign-up sheet again. It will be June 10th. And there are some really interesting things on here. There are pies. I know that Cindy is famous for her lemon pie. But I am famous with our grandchildren, with my um, Tombstone, Arizona pecan pie. To Tombstone, Arizona is kind of in the middle of pecan trees. And they ask for it at Thanksgiving and Christmas, and Easter, birthdays. Um, so look over the list. There are services different things that people will do um, and what makes it really fun is if you go to your basement or attic and find something that's kind of unique and uh, you think maybe somebody would be interested in it so I'm going to start over here passing it around thank you make sure it gets all the way around okay, please yeah. and remember if we have a lot of things signed up for we can invite our fam our family and friends so you know, we want to dig in somebody else's pockets occasionally. Yes. <laughs> so if you have anything that, as Marilyn has mentioned before, that you want to get, need to get rid of, that look is new or new looking. Um, and uh, again, services, something that you might make, please sign up for those. Um, and the only announcement I have is that after worship today, we will be assembling the bags out in the fellowship hall to go to the homeless kids here in Boulder. So please do that and do, let's do that before we grab our cup of coffee. Okay, and I, I must apologize. I did not ask our guest this morning how she wants to be introduced. How do you want to be introduced? I am Janice Adams. Janice, I'm a retired pastor. Okay. Janice is a retired pastor, and she and Bruce McQueen were talking so much that I could hardly introduce myself. So that's. <laughs> <laughs>
please stand now and join me responsibly in the call to worship. This is the day that God has made. The God who raised Jesus from the dead raises us daily to new life. If you have, if those of you at home, if you have a candle and you'd like to light it at this time, let us all join together as the light of Christ. Please remain standing for our first hymn, Morning Has Broken. <laughs> The sound of the piano was broken up at first period and now I'm not hearing anything. Just barely hearing little blips from the piano. Comma and no voices. Silence. Yeah, come on, I understand that. It seems like things were pretty good there for a little while. Currently very long periods of silence with a little blip of sound now and then. I'm a, mostly at the piano. Maybe seated. As my son-in-law says, we're good Presbyterians. We need stars that tell us when to hang up or stand up, but we can figure out when to sit down. <laughs> because Jesus has already been here and forgiven our sins, we have been forgiven. But I will read now the assurance of pardon, which will follow with the unison prayer of confession, which will then be followed by a few moments of silence where we can each confess our own sins. Hear now the assurance of pardon. Jesus has rescued us. He has led us out of the shame of sin into the honor of life with God. Know that you have been transformed through our God's love. Amen. Together now the prayer of confession. Gracious God, you encourage us with your love. We need your life giving power in our lives and in our relationships. We continue to live in grace, justice, pouring your healing presence and your spirit of peace not on us. May we glorify you. Christ, the risen one. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the Gloria.
Maybe seated.
What a powerful bunch out there. My goodness. <laughs> I couldn't hear too well except from the back, but it's beautiful people back here. Uh, before we do the prayers, I just wanted to do another uh, PS to um, what I am doing and why I'm here and introduce my husband, Samuel, who is my partner in ministry. He's in the front row with Samuel Adams. He says, uh, he always has this little quip. I have to say it for him is, you know, my good friend, Bud, Bud Weiser as well. Yeah. <laughs> He's had to say that in more churches than not, so I thought I'd do it for him. <laughs> and we've had a been a ministry team for many years and also had churches of our own and uh, retired recently at the Good Samaritan Village in uh, Loveland. And I'm absolutely thrilled um, to be there and nice to be back with you. Actually, we're, Eric and I, I first met Eric when he and I were serving on Committee on Ministry of Presbytery. He was just a young punk. Uh, new out of seminary, <laughs> and um, he brought a nice, fresh, new, young perspective uh, to our our committee for some time. And I think I got off, actually rotated off before he did. But uh, it was a joy to be invited to come back and to uh, be here in his in his absence. And I know you will miss him, but um, believe me, uh, sabbaticals are very important. Uh, times for pastors to just get away and do what they need to be doing to refresh themselves for becoming ministry because most of you know ministry is not easy it's uh it's challenging it's also fun and all those things and um so I think Sam you've been serving churches since 64 60 yeah graduated from seminary in 1964 seminary 1964 so he's I graduated from seminary in 1981, 81. So um, we have had um, much time together and separately in different things, but I'm really glad to be back here today and to uh, be um, leading worship with you today. As we, um, as somebody was telling me that you have prayers of the people and being hard of hearing old person myself, uh, it's better for you to tell me who or tell the congregation who you want prayers for rather than me try to repeat them because they don't come out right so <laughs> if anybody today has a prayer um, I guess I'll start by saying I have a prayer of thanksgiving for being back among you today and uh, seeing all your faces anybody else have a prayer they'd like to come up and let us bring all these prayers before God as we have already God thank you for hearing us today our prayers of concern, our prayers of joy. Thank you for this absolutely beautiful, stunning place where we worship in this gorgeous day. Sometimes we forget the thanksgiving and gratitude parts of our prayers, and we add those today to um, our list of things and our concerns for people. 
God, we know you are a healer and that you are present with people and all of us in and through all of the challenges that we face as human beings. We lift up our nation, our world to you. So many things are going on that need your help and your intervention. We pray your blessing upon the leadership of all of the nations of our world, that they may have wisdom and compassion and love for the people. Oh God, we lift these prayers in the name of the one who taught us to pray, Jesus Christ, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt. We forgive our sin against us and lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. In the power and the glory forever. We had a pastor friend um, who used to talk, who used to do workshops, and he did stewardship workshops on giving and offerings, that kind of thing. And he used to call the offering time where we put in our spendable prayer. You could almost write a sermon on that. Yeah, this is our prayers. Not only do we pray as we just did, or also with our gifts and our giving, and with the gifts you're giving to the children of this community as well. So this is a time when the um, we have a chance to use our spendable prayer and for God's work and God's help. Will the ushers come up and receive it, please? Thank 
Let us pray. God, we thank you for the ability to share some of what we have, for the spendable prayer that you put in each of our hands and in our lives, and for the generosity and the giving hearts that you give us to respond to your love in tangible ways. Bless now these gifts as they leave our hands and they move into our community and our world to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Seated. I've chosen two scriptures today to um, to reflect on for us during this post-Easter time. The first one is from the Gospel of John, and the scripture references John 13, verses 31 to 35. This takes place um, while Jesus is still with his disciples and right after Judas um, runs away that dreadful night when uh, he betrayed his Lord. So we're listening to John's gospel. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am, I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. That's our gospel reading. And the next reading is from the book of Acts of the Apostles. Um, it's Acts 11, 11 to 18. The story that uh, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, is telling about his own experience and his own kind of conversion time uh, relating this story. Three men had, were sent to me from Caesarea, stopping at my house where I was staying, and the Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered this man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. And then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think I should stand in God's way? And I did jump too, too fast in here because I went right past Peter's vision, which sets the tone for this, and I grabbed the wrong uh, starting place. Anyway, going back, Peter is telling the whole story, which begins with he was in uh, Joppa, a city, praying and went into a trance and saw this vision where this great big sheet came down. And he looked in it and he saw four footed animals of earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. And then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, and kill and eat. And I replied, Surely not. No, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And then it was all pulled up to heaven again. So that's the beginning of the story. And then, Jesus, then he is called to go and to reach out to the Gentile people in another community. These scriptures have given us a, some snapshots of the family of God. They're different in different times. John, the gospel reader, writer, pictures Jesus near the end of his earthly ministry, gathering the disciples around him and saying, little children, I'm with you only a little bit longer. You're going to look for me, but I'm not going to be here. And where I am going, you cannot come. For three years, Jesus had been building his disciples into a, a tight kinship, to a tight community of people. They lived, they traveled, they worshiped, they worked closely with Jesus. They were a family. Now Jesus was about to pass the mantle on to them. They would soon be responsible for carrying on this work and ministry. What an assignment. Then Jesus laid on these little band of gathered disciples, I give you a new commandment, not just that you love one another, but that you love as I have loved you. You should love others as I have loved you. Now stop and think about that one, that assignment and how astounding that must have been. As we look at some snapshots of Jesus' life and ministry, we look at the examples of what he's talking about, the radical ways Jesus loved other people. He touched and even healed those considered by a society to be untouchables. He called unclean people, the people they called unclean, living outside the strict rules and regulations of Jesus' law were part of his company. He particularly sought out those kinds of so-called outcasts, and he hung out with them. He even invited himself to the home of a hated tax collector. Jesus was always on the cutting edge of justice and fairness for everyone. He even challenged an unfair and punitive practices of the Roman Empire, as well as the religious establishment around him. That kept certain people out on the fringes of society, away from the sacred places. If indeed Jesus' mandate was to draw a circle big enough to include all people in the family of God, this was a very tall order. This theme of inclusiveness brings us into today's reading from the book of Acts. Peter, whom we just heard about, one of the disciples of Jesus tells that powerful story about his own vision and he was told to, from this vision, draw the circle of the family of God bigger than just these Jewish converts they'd been working for and working with. They'd been building their community out of Jewish people, and now they were called to widen the circle. And in his vision, as I read, this sheet came down with all these no-nos and all these things that the dietary rules said, no, you cannot touch this, no, you cannot eat this. And when God said, yes, you will eat these, he protested and he said, what God has made clean, you must not call profane, Peter. This was a sea change for Peter, a huge 
paradigm shift. God's message was crystal clear, but Gentiles, non-Jewish people, were to be included as part of the family of God and received the gift of God's mercy and saving grace as they had. Peter was immediately summoned by God to go and meet the Gentile community in Caesarea and offer them a gift of baptism. My friends, God calls us to show radical love, barrier-breaking love, love like Jesus showed others in his own life and his own ministry. If we had a dramatic dream like Peter, what might we find in that sheet or something lowered down in front of us? It probably would not be forbidden food. Maybe people of color, people who worship differently from us, poor people, addicted people, homeless people, people with mental illness, illiterate people, the list goes on and on. That was what it would be in the container that God would put before us, I believe. And what about those people who are out of touch? Their political views are radically different from mine. Must we widen the circle to include them? It's human nature to hunker down and keep house with those that we already know, those we feel safe with, and not reach out to strangers. I would like to practice reaching out to strangers in the grocery store. It always startles them because we're not used to talking to each other, but I mentioned something about somebody's baby or I don't do it, you know, all the time obsessively, but just take notice of people around me. But it's very startling because they're not used to conversation in the in the supermarkets aisles. We must face head on to our fear, face down our self-pride, open our hearts to all of the family of God. Not just selected few that are more like we are. And that is no easy task. Before I went to seminary, I was I came face to face with my fear and prejudice against a population of people I had rarely encountered in my protected life. My new job as mission coordinator of First Presbyterian Church in downtown Portland, Oregon, congregation of 1,600 members, sent me down in a neighborhood where people pushed around grocery carts containing all of their worldly possessions. People who were mentally ill and dealing with some with alcohol and drug addiction or both were out on our sidewalks outside the church by day and they slept under the freeway bridge across the street at night. Several of our downtown churches, including First Presbyterian, ran a cooperative lunch program three days a week and it met in the basement in the building in our church. Well, being the resident church social worker, in fact, some of the people in church called me, those are Jan's people. <laughs> so we don't want, you. they're yours. <laughs> I was the point person. They had to go downstairs, co-mingle with our guests. Some of them were mentally off. Some of them smelled. Um, I was called to go down to love them, to befriend them, and to sit with them at meals, which was a little difficult at times. I remember the first day I was going downstairs, not knowing what I was getting into, and I started, you know, be with the lunch bunch, as we called them. I was terrified because I was only thinking about me. What could I say? How was I going to act around these strangers? I wanted to run back upstairs and hide in my office where it was safe. I couldn't, and I wouldn't, and I didn't. Interacting with that community was part of my job. Four years I worked in that church, three days a week, doing on-the-job training with people outside my comfort zone. The learning curve was pretty steep. One important lesson I learned was how being physically and emotionally present with others tops all the wonderful programs we can create to serve them. I wanna say that again. The lesson I learned, how to be physically and emotionally present with others, tops all the wonderful programs we can create to serve them, where we can just put them out there and they can be served. This is a personal thing. It's in those face-to-face -face encounters with others 
that our barrier breaking God can most powerfully work in and among us, empowering us to show the kind of love Jesus commanded us to show. But just like Jesus did, we must have the courage to venture into those scary places where we might feel uncomfortable, like maybe in a mission, maybe serving soup kitchens, that kind of thing. Be present to people we find difficult to be around. As a nation, we face many challenges as our culture is shifting in demographics. Some of the faces we see on our screens and on our streets are immigrant people seeking refuge and a better life for themselves and families. Some of them might just move into our neighborhood, looking for acceptance and looking for friends, most of all for love. I learned years ago, I cannot love others by myself. That's a big statement for me. I cannot love others by myself. My feeble attempts at love are self-serving and conditional. If I'm to love others as Jesus loves me, if I'm to include others in my version of the family of God, I have to get out of the way and make room for God's love to shine through me. That means releasing my power, my expectations or outcomes to God. As my AA friends say, letting go and letting God. My friends, in loving others and loving ourselves, we are never alone. Don't forget that. We are never alone in loving other people. God's love is always within and around us and always available to us. So I challenge each of us this morning to leave this place of worship ready to partner, partner with God in showing God's love for all people whom we encounter. For I believe indeed we are all, everyone is part of the family of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to stand and sing with me, um, God of grace and God of glory, as we prepare to leave this place. Yeah. 
So my friends, as we go out today, go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the heart, faint hearted and support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, rejoicing in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now may the love of God, the community, and loving service of Jesus Christ, who sends us out into the world to love, and the Holy Spirit sent to us to work within us and with us. We leave in the name of the triune God. Amen. Amen. Please join in meeting one another. Peace of Christ be with you. Amen.